So maybe a first question would be, give us a state of just your tribe. Madison has just been designated in December to Rex Field as the home of F-35A. Doctor, can you start? Give us an overview. Wisconsin is continuing to interview officials on the front lines in the fight against COVID-19 and the ramifications for, well, all of Wisconsin's economy. Caleb Frostman is the Secretary of the Department of Workforce Development. They have handled just, we'll let you know in a minute, millions of uh, unemployment benefit claims. Last week, DWD, Workforce Development, put out a, a very interesting press release with some very common questions. So I asked the secretary, if he, if I could walk him through those questions and answers, because they're questions on the minds of thousands of Wisconsin residents right now. And Caleb, thanks so much for rejoining us. Very happy to be here, Steve. Thanks for having me. Well, they were good questions, and I've got a few of my own because you know me. Um, first one: Did the Supreme Court ruling affect unemployment claims, Mr. Secretary? So they will not uh, affect how um, you know we are uh, continuing to. Um, work with with folks and um, if folks if there are claims in the hopper uh, that will not uh, affect uh, our determinations or uh, our work processes going forward um, so people should continue to file their weekly claims and uh, we'll continue to do our work on our end uh, as it relates to uh, determining eligibility for claimants here in Wisconsin and the agency has paid out 1.14 billion with a B in benefits correct mr. secretary that's correct. Between uh, state unemployment insurance and the federal pandemic unemployment compensation, that extra $600 per week uh, with back pay, uh, we've paid $1.1 billion uh, to folks here in Wisconsin. Well, that federal uh, supplementary payment, 600 a week, some people say that's pretty generous, but there are some factors that need to be considered. Can you talk a minute about that? Sure. Uh, the the FPUC program, uh, the $600 per week, is you know meant to be a supplement to unemployment insurance. Um, but also meant to be an economic stimulus, and it's also temporary. Uh, and so, when folks are factoring in those those dollars per week that they're receiving on unemployment, um, you know that's pre-tax. So folks are taxed on those dollars. Uh, they don't include an em employer, you know, healthcare contribution or retirement contribution. So uh, the same amount of expenses need to come out of that uh, without a lot of the relief that folks get when they're attached to uh, an employment situation. So um, you know, we're hopeful that folks can stay afloat uh, with those extra dollars uh, through July, and of course. Um, you know, folks can are eligible for, for back pay to the passage of the CARES Act, which is really April, uh, if they are, if their claim is back to that date. So um, we're hopeful that that'll keep not only families afloat, but also uh, in large part Wisconsin's economy. And that extra 600 only until the end of July, Mr. Secretary? That's as of right now, yep, the CARES Act has it going through that last week in July. Okay, now let's go back to some of the uh, uh, questions on your press release. As businesses starting to reopen, uh, and that's true across Wisconsin, although in differing stages. Um, will will my uh, unemployment benefits be paid even if I go to work before I received my first uh, U of I check or my case has not been decided? No. So if you've uh, we determine uh, someone's eligible uh, for that time that they weren't employed, even if they've returned to work, uh, they can get uh, payment for those weeks that they were out of work through no fault of their own. Uh, so folks should continue to uh, you know, file those weekly claims for the weeks that they were out of work, uh, and that will not affect uh, their payment for those uh, eligible weeks. Okay. What if an employer who now has work for laid off or furloughed employees, but they refuse to go back to work? Uh, there's a process that the agency calls adjudication. What does that mean? So that's really a fancy word for determining eligibility. So there's different nuances to every case. Um, you know, Generally speaking, if, if someone refuses to work, that could cause an eligibility issue because um, the, the main thrust of unemployment insurance is that you're out of work through no fault of your own. And in this case, the employee, not the employer, would be uh, choosing not to go to work. Uh, but that adjudication process can consider uh, other factors um, that you know might investigate whether someone might still be eligible. Um, and, and of course, we'd encourage people um, to look at the PUA program as well. Uh, but that adjudication word is really just a, a fancy way of saying investigating uh, a way to determine eligibility for unemployment insurance. Now, your agency has been swamped, both with claims and the uh, adjudication process. So let's just ask, uh, uh, the adjudication process, how long might it take? 
So it depends. Every, again, every case is uh, unique and specific. So there are some folks that have one really simple, uh, easily fixed hold, and we've removed a bunch of those this week for uh, educators. That was a really uh, you know, simple process. And some folks might have uh, nine issues that require uh, a call to a previous employer or a call to the claimant. And so it really depends on that individual and their employment history and the nature of uh, departing from previous work and some of those things. So um, yeah, it could be very, very simple or very, very complicated. And we're trying to be strategic about how we uh, attack those, of course, in a um, uh, fashion that looks at time, but also the complexity and how we can release as many holds uh, as early as possible. What about if I've been furloughed or laid off and my employer calls and says, you know, I don't have enough work for you full time, but part time. Um, what should be the factors when I consider and what would I lose in U of I benefits if I went back just part time? That's a great question. And again, it depends on the specific circumstance, but there are uh, opportunities for partial UI if folks go back and work uh, part time. And so um, I believe that the threshold is $500 per week in income is the threshold. Uh, but uh, also we have a really successful program uh, that's nationwide, but Wisconsin's been a leader uh, in work share, uh, which allows employers to reduce hours uh, across a work unit, and that keeps people attached to their uh, benefits uh, and also partial wages, but partial UI. And then if you're on the work share program, you also get that $600 a week. And so we've seen just a, a massive increase uh, in the usage of work share prior to COVID. Uh, in four years, we had 20 programs since we started um, COVID-19, we've had 340 programs with 10 or more than 14,000 employees on WorkShare. And so there are opportunities there for employers to look at for WorkShare. Uh, but if you're an employee returning part-time, you do have um, potential uh, eligibility for partial unemployment insurance. Okay. Uh, I love this organic nature of this interview because we're, uh, here's a Facebook question from Brian. Can you please tell me how many weeks of an extension do we get after the 13 weeks of pandemic extensions? So in my understanding is it depends on the program. So if you're in traditional unemployment insurance, you get 26 weeks, um, we can extend benefits for the 13. And for those folks that have been exhausted, uh, that's what that PEUC is for. That's 13 weeks. Um, and PUA, so there's a lot of different acronyms flying around, but PUA is the program for folks that are self-employed, independent contractors, um, freelancers. That program is uh, up to 39 weeks. And so uh, it depends on the program you're eligible for. Uh, but for the PEUC, uh, it's a 13-week extension. Now, um, the agency had an error and double-sent double, double sent $600 to a few of the recipients. Have those all been um, reclaimed, or have you been able to get that back? We have, yeah. So that was a, uh, um, a programming error as we were onboarding um, the new FPUC program. And so as a lot of folks have probably seen, we're operating on a, a 50-year uh, base benefit system known as COBOL. Uh, and it's just really challenging to onboard new programs out of this antiquated system that's pretty inflexible. Um, and so we worked that out pretty quickly. Uh, as far as all of the approved or the claims that have been approved, uh, we've made all the back payments for uh, FPUC uh, and continue to make the weekly payments for people that are eligible. And the, the important thing to remember is if you're eligible for even a dollar uh, of unemployment insurance or PUA uh, or PEUC uh, that includes on work share, uh, you get the $600 a week. So that's a, a really important piece for folks to know that you need to do nothing else. If, if you're eligible for UI or for PUA, you get the $600 a week. We're happy to have worked out that bug. And as, as new holds are, are lifted, uh, folks have been getting their back pay. What if I'm called back to work but can't return because I need to take care of my child since my daycare, my schools are not open, sir? Sure. So that's, uh, again, going back to the, the, the litmus test for unemployment insurance. Uh, but we, if there are questions, we'd certainly uh, encourage you to apply. And there's an opportunity um, within PUA. So if you're uh, denied for uh, unemployment insurance, um, the qualifications for PUA uh, include some of those scenarios. And so we'd encourage people uh, to apply for the pandemic unemployment assistance, uh, which we started taking applications for about a month ago. Uh, and we're hoping to uh, deploy for our first payments yet this week. How do I report that I, this is someone receiving benefits, turn down my employer's request that I return to work. What if I don't report that, Mr. Secretary? Sure. Um, you should definitely uh, you know, report that uh, on your weekly uh, claim for benefits. You've turned down work to ask a question. Uh, if you turned down an offer and the answer would be yes. So within um, your claims benefit for the week, uh, you would want to answer yes to that question uh, to be accurate in your, your claims going forward. 
Qu- a Facebook question from Ashley. What is the current backlog for uh, adjudication? And tell me how many more additional uh, adjudicators the agency uh, is in the process of hiring. Sure. Well, it fluctuates day to day based on the work we get done and the new claims that come in. But, um, you know, as of early this week, I think we were around 230 or 240,000 issues. Now, that's not distinct claimants. That's, again, one claimant could have nine issues, um, but it's about affecting about 140,000 claimants that had holds. And so um, we have about 100 or 125 adjudicators currently working. Uh, we're hoping to hire um, a number more, probably about 100 hires. Uh, we've also signed a contract for an external vendor uh, with uh, up to 200 adjudicators at this external center. And so as we look to you know, attack this backlog and, and like I said, clear claims as quickly and accurately as possible, uh, those adjudicators play a key role uh, in doing so accurately and quickly. And so that's a, a big focus for us. Of course, also the you know customer service reps on the phone that help walk people through claims. Uh, but as far as you know, the the greatest um, accelerator of clearing claims, um, adjudicators play a really key role in that process. Well, in February, you told me that your your agency, the U the U of I division, had about 500 employees. Talk to me. How many will you have uh, after you make these hires uh, a month from now, six weeks from now? Sure. Yeah, it's been interesting. So at the very beginning of this, we started building out the infrastructure for this massive hiring. And it, take, it took a little bit of time to you know, give people on loan from other agencies to do interview panels. We've conducted, you know, I think uh, for sure north of uh, you know, 1,200 interviews, probably closer to 2,000 uh, for external hires. And so that's been going on for uh, weeks now as we've worked through our external hire process. We uh, are aiming to hire 315 new hires. Um, we've got about 150 that have been made thus far. Uh, but then with the external vendors, uh, the first of which we brought online uh, today, started taking calls. Uh, that will be fully staffed by with 500 people. Uh, we're on uh, course to do that. We had uh, about 60 folks taking calls today, about 120 more started on Monday uh, for training. Uh, so all told with all the external vendors, uh, the external hires, and then uh, I've transferred about, about 20% of my non-UI staff into unemployment insurance within DWD, as well as uh, getting some loaners from other parts of state government, uh, we could be bringing on and are hoping to be bringing on as many as twelve or thirteen hundred new people uh, into uh, UI, which is you know uh, pretty remarkable. Starting from five hundred in uh, mid March to potentially as many as uh, seventeen or eighteen hundred uh, in the next few weeks. Here, quick follow up: Are we state taxpayers paying for this, these additional twelve hundred U of I division workers, sir? So the, I guess there's a a nuanced answer to that question. So uh, unemployment insurance uh, is paid for uh, with federal administrative funds, and that is uh, funded through uh, employer taxes to both uh, the federal government and to state government. The federal dollars pay for administration of UI. Uh, The state tax goes to fund the trust fund. And so um, the federal dollars and those uh, that also came in relief through the CARES Act uh, and other legislation related to covid I have provided some emergency funds to help us uh, with that fast on-ramp, uh, but generally speaking, UI has been funded through federal dollars. Another Facebook question. Can you, t- can you please tell us why people who have BARS, capital B-A-R-S, and I'm not familiar with that, what that means, are not eligible for the FPUC, the $600 additional payments? Are you familiar with BARS? I must admit I'm not, sir. Sure. So that's, um, you know, looking back at um, folks that either... Um, had uh, fraud issues or overpayments in the past. And so again, the, the main issue for uh, FPUC is if you are um, eligible for even a dollar of UI or a dollar of PUA. And until that overpayment issue is corrected, um, folks are not eligible for uh, a dollar of UI or a dollar of PUA. And so until that happens, um, folks are not eligible for FPUC. So once, once that is cleared, once that is caught up, then uh, folks are eligible for that. Uh, but until that happens, um, they're not eligible for the $600 per week through FPA. Okay. A question from the agency's press release last week. A person who has refused an offer of work due to concerns about personal safety, are they eligible for benefits or does that depend on the specifics? Again, this covers some of the stuff that we've been through before, but it's very important to people out there. Sure. Yeah, we absolutely get that. I think that's a, a very, very common question from uh, constituents as well as legislators. Uh, and again, it's nuanced, depends on the circumstances. There could be considered a work refusal, um, but there are also you know, potential 
um, for um, if you were turned down work for good reason, that could be part of that adjudication or eligibility determination process. Um, and Wisconsin is one of about two dozen states in the country. If there are safety concerns uh, when folks do return, you know, our, our uh, outlet or valve for safety regulations in Wisconsin is OSHA. And so if you have complaints, uh, Wisconsin does not have a specific workplace safety agency. Uh, within DWD, we have workers count for workplace injuries. Uh, but when it comes to uh, overall safety, uh, OSHA is the uh, governing body for workplace safety here in Wisconsin. Okay, specific questions, specific circumstances, uh, but uh, it just, uh, it has a lot of emotion. I'm a server in Wisconsin, and our management is having all staff come together next week for food tasting because our head chef has designed a new menu. Many of us are uncomfortable with this. Do you know if we have any options on how to handle this or who we could contact for further guidance? The meeting is considered mandatory. And this is an example of someone who's been laid off or furloughed saying, hey, we're doing this next week. You have to make a decision, uh, please. Sure. So from our, you know, our, our seat and my seat, you know, I think the, the guidance, um, you know, I don't think we have specific DWD guidance, but in terms of um, the safety of that uh, event, I would certainly look to DHS for what they've um, released as far as what's appropriate, maybe sharing that with management, um, especially with the sharing of food. Um, it's really unfortunate with, um, you know, kind of the, the patchwork of, um, you know, local governments having to, you know, step up with the, the safer at home uh, piece um, being struck down by the Supreme Court, but um, the, the best guidance that we can offer is certainly, um, you know, look to, to DHS to what they put out for what's what's appropriate, and hopefully share that with management in the in the best um, best light possible, and hopefully that uh, that can be resolved safely. This gets into another question, but these are important and it's related. What options are available for employees concerned about workplace safety? I don't feel that my my employer, as we go back, has enough new guidelines in place, new rules, new safety uh, settings to make me comfortable? Sure. Um, well, I think, again, um, if there are complaints, the, the best avenue for Wisconsin um, is, is OSHA. But um, the other piece is just, you know, I think as, as we look even big picture safety or not, the, the communication between employer and employee is going to be uh, key going forward. Um, like I said, whether it's safety or just economic in general, uh, you know, of course, servers and, and those type of folks likely won't be teleworking, but, um, you know, we're getting a lot of big picture questions about that and, and a common uh, answer and solution, at least part of the answer and solution uh, has been uh, greater communication between those two parties to make sure that everyone is on the same page, uh, feeling safe and, and feeling uh, healthy at work. Another nuance of the same issue. Is it, un is it unlawful to, to, re to re this is a question that an employer might face. Is it unlawful to retaliate against a worker for engaging in legally protected activity, which can include requesting medical accommodation or complaining about unsafe work conditions. Back to the unsafe work conditions, sir. Sure. So I think you know employers should really consult with their HR uh, or legal counsels. I'm, I'm not an attorney, and I know our folks are are looking deep into that. But also, um, you know, if you if employers are looking for for greater guidance, um, you know, our uh, Equal Rights Division, which which deals with um, you know workplace discrimination and Fair Employment Act. Um, you know, generally we want employers to be mindful of avoiding making return to work decisions based on things like age or marital status, uh, a real or perceived disability, or any other protected classes. And then, you know, just make sure those return to work decisions are made on non-discriminatory factors, such as whether work duties are essential or not essential, um, if folks have the ability to perform those duties remotely, uh, and whether individual medical risks, uh, which might require accommodation. So, um, certainly advise folks to talk to HR and the legal counsel, um, and also our Equal Rights Division can be a, a resource for that as well. Okay. You've dealt with this repeatedly. The emotions of people who have tried and tried and tried to file and get an answer. I'm just going to read uh, three sentences, that's all. I've been trying since March to get unemployment, and after I log in, it says I have to be an, an authorized user. How can my, uh, this is a, another query from a Facebook uh, how can my dear friend get unemployment? She comes to a screen that says she needs to be approved and has a number to call. Phone busy all the time. We contacted her local legislators. Nothing was done. She has no reserves and no way to pay bills. Um, I realize your agency has been cr confronted with how many claims in the last two months, sir? Sir? Sure. So it's been about uh, north of 2 million weekly claims. And um, yeah. 
2 million weekly claims. And, and just for context, prior to COVID, we were averaging about 45,000 weekly claims. Uh, for the last four weeks, it's been north of 330,000 uh, weekly claims. It's been a, a, you know, a rapid, you know, that's a matter of eight or nine weeks that we've seen that uh, move up so quickly. But um, you know, our, 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 our hearts go out to all these claimants. And we, we take these calls and emails every day from folks and understand that the struggles are, are very real and the anxiety they're facing is, is overwhelming. And we're, um, and I can assure uh, everyone watching that our, our top priority is to pay every eligible claim as fast as humanly possible for those reasons that unemployment insurance is meant to be there for people who are out of work to no fault of their own. And we want to make sure that those dollars get in the hands of the folks that need it. And so that's why we've been, you know, since day one, standing up um, these hiring uh, pieces because we're working with antiquated technology and, and, a, and a, you know, a limited staff initially that we want to get um, you know, those folks paid as fast as possible. And a really important piece to remember um, and hopefully it's, it's some solace for the folks out there who are, um, are struggling is that everyone will get, if they're determined eligible, uh, every dollar they're entitled to, in, in, including back pay. So know that um, you know, the people at DWD, we have hundreds of folks uh, working overtime weekly, uh, sometimes 70, 80 hours a week uh, to help with this process and to get um, our system set up to, uh, to a level where we can you know, process uh, as many claims as we possibly can uh, and get these folks paid as, paid as fast as possible. And, and the team in place there, uh, you know, there's there's not a whole lot of prestige or public appreciation or, or money in public service. It's all about wanting to help people. And that's why our folks are there. And that's why they're putting in the hours they're putting in and, uh, you know, training the new folks as we onboard. I know you're frustrated. We're getting Facebook questions from people who are frustrated. So here's my question. What metric do you as the secretary have to to cite that the response time is improving or that the, the process of uh, answering these claims is getting better, sir? Sure. Well, we keep seeing, you know, week over week, the, the percentage of claims paid continues to increase, even as uh, the weekly claims uh, stay at a pretty sustained high level. Um, so we see that inching up and, you know, the, the gap between what's paid and what's not paid is a, a really nuanced bucket of folks. It could be people that were denied, uh, folks that are being held for uh, adjudication, uh, and also uh, the folks in that VAR category. And so uh, we continue to make progress week over week with, you know, a limited staff that's been uh, work to the bone. They're they're fatigued. They're you know working as hard as they can. Uh, folks are asking you know volunteering and, and and pleading to work on Memorial Day because they want to continue to knock down this backlog. And so seeing that you know weekly uh, or percentage of, of claims paid uh, continue to grow uh, with you know the the initial um, folks we're bringing on board uh, is encouraging to me. And it'll only uh, grow faster if we bring on more folks. Okay, a press release either yesterday or today from your agency. Uh, dealing with fraud, 342 unsuccessful attempts to collect benefits with stolen Social Security numbers, but then the agency points out out of 1.4 million claims seeking 1 billion, um, those, uh, those, uh, th there were 171 claims of potential fraud, only to totaling 26,000. So my question is, and I'm not asking it very well, are you satisfied that there is not a uh, significant wholesale attempt to defraud the U of I system? I don't know about the attempt, but I certainly know our response, I think, has been really swift. And Wisconsin's been um, a leader for a long time. We've got some of the, the national, most foremost recognized fraud experts uh, working in UI uh, in senior level positions. So the, the, I think the, the attempts will likely continue. We, uh, other states are seeing it worse than we are, uh, but we are certainly uh, attacking uh, and detecting and deterring fraud um, at a really significant level. And so we'll continue to, to keep um, our eye on this because it's obviously uh, you know problematic, but I think the scale of, of, of what we're working with and, and what we've seen as far as fraud, um, I think what we're doing is working, but we're going to continue to monitor that very closely uh, because you know, as we're trying to get uh, eligible claimants paid, you know, the last thing we need are, are folks um, fraudulently seeking these dollars that they're not entitled to. So we're continuing to work hard to make sure those those rings are, are not found. Two or three weeks ago, the agency said if we continue to pay out X number of claims, uh, state claims averaging 355, 355 per week is the average state benefit. The fund might be uh, depleted by October. Now, I know you can borrow from the feds after that. That's what we did in the Great Recession. But can you update the timeline for the potential exhaustion of the state U of I fund? Sure. Yeah, so it's interesting. The, um, there are a lot of nuances that go into those calculations. And, and of course, you made all the qualifiers that this wasn't our official position and that these are just you know hypotheticals. Um, but it's important to recognize that you know, as employers continue to pay unemployment insurance taxes uh, at the state level, uh, those are deposited in the trust fund. Um, and then, you know, depending on the sustained level of weekly claims, 
um, you know, that can can deplete the fund. Uh, but there are contributions, you know, it's likely still going in. And it's important to remember, as, as you and I you know, spoke earlier, um, that we're in a much better position uh, this time around than we were before the Great Recession. Um, yes. Prior to COVID-19, our trust fund balance is about $1.9 billion. Uh, and I believe before the Great Recession, it was somewhere between five and 600 million. Um, so if we do uh, exhaust the fund, uh, we can borrow from the feds. Uh, and I think through the end of the year, it's at 0% interest. I don't think we've got guidance uh, beyond uh, January 1, 2021. Uh, but we are in a much, much better place than we were uh, 10 years ago. And so we're, we're you know, watching that very closely and uh, it's, it's, we'll continue to, to monitor that. But uh, we do have the option of borrowing from the Fed should we exhaust the fund. Okay, we've got about two or three minutes left. One more question from Tracy, Facebook question. The DWD is hiring now. What are the qualifications that you're looking for? Do you have to be a college grad to process these claims or to uh, adjudicate and investigate? What, what, what career qualifications are you looking for? That's a great question. And if folks are out there, the, the positions are listed at wisc.jobs. Um, and so whether it's a claim specialist or an adjudicator, uh, it depends on the position, but you know, for the adjudicators, we're looking for investigatory skills, good communication skills, uh, that we want people to be able to ask the right questions. Uh, make a determination on their own um, and, and do the, the search. And then for uh, the claim specialists, of course, we're looking for great customer service skills. So I, I don't think all the, the jobs require a college degree. Um, based on the amount of confident, confidential information that those positions handle, uh, there's definitely, you know, obviously, a criminal background check and other security pieces that go into place. Um, so that's, you know, can be a hurdle for some folks, but we want to make sure that that information is protected. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to look at WISC.jobs. Uh, some of these positions can be done remotely, uh, some in the building. Uh, and they're located throughout Wisconsin. So I would encourage folks to, to look at those. We're still, like I said, about halfway there on the external hires. Uh, I would love to, uh, to hire the rest of them. Okay. I don't want to harp on this, but a, a number of our Facebook questioners are saying this generic comment. We've been waiting six weeks, seven weeks. Um, we, we aren't hearing back from DWD. What should we do? Keep calling? Wait? Sure. I, I would encourage folks to keep calling. And with the uh, bringing on board the new call center uh, today, we've expanded our call center hours. They used to be 7.35 to 3.30. Uh, and when that ends, that's just when we stop taking new calls. We clear the queue. We've expanded it to 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm not sure where folks are in the process that are having issues, but um, we try really hard to make sure our online claimant portal and our online FAQs are up to date so folks can get the information they need. Uh, but with the expansion of that, we're hopeful that um, both incoming calls will be uh, more easily uh, accessible with increased capacity, uh, but then also that's going to free up our existing staff to make outbound calls. We're going to have a, an appointment system for uh, phone calls that can't be resolved on an inbound call and have our claim specialists make outbound calls. So we appreciate everyone's uh, patience. I know it's been a difficult uh, couple of weeks, uh, but with the expansion of that call center, we're hopeful to have uh, significantly increased capacity to answer folks' questions and update them on their claims. Okay, Mr. Secretary, we're going to end this by showing on a graphic the contact, the ways that people can contact. So we're listing four of them. General information, dwdwisconsin.gov slash COVID-19. Then the CARES Act federal stimulus bill, dwdwisconsin.gov, U of I, Ben, CARES Act. Then uh, to apply for benefits, dwdwisconsin.gov, U I, Ben, apply. And then the phone number. So these are the four ways that people can continue to check on their uh, app or contact you for the first time, correct? Correct. Correct. And um, if there's other, we usually uh, do pretty um, updated real-time uh, posts on our social media channels, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, which usually tie back to the website. But if folks want timely updates, uh, we try to do a couple a day uh, based on the frequently asked questions we're getting from claimants and also on updates that we're making either to our state programs or the federal programs. Okay. Okay. You've got about 15 second wrap up. Your agency was swamped. You're making progress and look out over the next four to five weeks, sir. Sure. I think we're, I think all uh, excited and, and you know, to some extent relieved to be bringing on uh, these additional thousand staff and training them because um, the volume has been immense. And like I said, our, our number one mission is to make sure that all eligible claimants are paid in full and as fast as possible. And we understand that folks are really struggling. And so um, I think you know May's been, been a pivotal month for us to get these call centers stood up, uh, but we're hopeful over the next four or five weeks uh, that the additional staff we're bringing on will continue to uh, accelerate the clearing of that backlog and help out the claimants in Wisconsin who need this money uh, really badly. 
I want to thank our face view Facebook viewers for their questions, but most of all, I want to thank Caleb Frostman, Secretary of the State Department of Workforce Development. Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for taking my questions and the Facebook questions, and maybe we'll have to do this again, sir. I would like that. Thank you, Steve, for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm John Hinkus, President of Wisconsin Eye Public Affairs Network, and I'm speaking to you today to ask for your financial support. For 14 years, Wisconsin Eye has provided uninterrupted, gavel-to-gavel -gavel live coverage from our state capitol, the legislature, the Supreme Court, the governor's office. We're proud to continue to do that and continue through this time of crisis with important coverage. We are 100% committed to bringing these important meetings into your home or place of work. We've created online pathways that allow us to connect you live with these important events. But Wisconsin I needs your help to do so. At this time, we are facing unprecedented staffing, technical, and financial challenge. So if you rely on our coverage to stay informed on issues you care and need to know about, I ask that you consider a one-time charitable gift today to help us through this challenge. Whether you're following the DHS briefings, the Wisconsin Elections Commission, or leadership briefings from the state capitol, or any of the timely interviews conducted by our senior producer, Steve Walters, we could use your support today. If just a fraction of the thousands who value Wisconsin Eye coverage say yes, with a gift of any size, it will provide a huge boost. So thank you. To donate, please text WISEY to 44321. That's W-I-S-E-Y-E -E to 44321. Or visit WISEY.org slash donate. W-I-S-E-Y-E dot -E O-R-G slash donate. Or you could send a check to 122 West Washington Avenue, Suite 200, Madison, Wisconsin, 53703. Again, thank you so much. Please be safe. Stay optimistic. We are Wisconsin. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.